uh, welcome back to the Vein and Lymphatic Forum. We are streaming live from the DeBakey CB Live Studios at Houston Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas. I am Ulysses Baltazar, I'm your host. And before we start with our program today, um, I'd like to do some housekeeping um, stuff that I, they asked me to do. First of all, if you have any questions or comments during the stream, feel free to uh, uh, let us know through the information that they are letting you uh, that they are letting you see in the screen. Uh, at any point, they will uh, they will be well received, and we'll try to address as much as uh, we can. Uh, of those questions. Um, the, the program today is going to be more interactive and uh, we are going to do some case presentations. So uh, at the end of each case, if there are any questions to address, that will be the moment we are going to do that. Uh, then the, uh, for all of you that are joining us for the first time, I'd like to just give you a brief intro. Uh, the Vein and Lymphatic Forum is this uh, program that is streamed live the fourth Wednesday of every month at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time in, in uh, the United States. And uh, um, we try to address all the innovation, uh, controversial topics and uh, cases, etc., within the Vein and Lymphatic uh, realm. This is something that has been going on, um, the transformation of, the, of the, ve the vein field, the venous field in medicine, joining with the lymphatic for the past five, seven years, and now is in, in, in full force. So we think it's important for us to have this forum here so we can uh, address all these issues. Uh, once all that being said, I'd like to welcome a good friend of mine, a colleague and partner, he's a great surgeon, uh, that agreed to help me today with this, with this show, Dr. Jean Bismuth. Thank you, Lissies, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually really excited to do this with you. Um, and I'm, I'm happy you brought up um, what your program is all about because I think there is actually a real gap in our understanding and our appreciation of uh, venous lymphatic disorders. And so having this available to people, I think, is really going to you know, offer a lot to, to our um, uh, colleagues, and, uh, and I hope uh, that this program will as well today. I can offer a little piece of, of what I know something about. <laughs> no, 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 your, your information is valuable and is very, is well, is well received. Yeah, you're right, there is a lot of uh, um, uh, a gap in the training and, and learning of lymphatics, especially in the vascular surgery arena. Correct, and I think, you know, t today, you know, if you look at it back five years ago, um, there was actually very little innovation in, in venous and lymphatics. Uh, particularly in venous, there is a lot of innovation, particularly in the last two, three years, things have come on the market that weren't available to us before. Um, and I think this is a place where you can introduce some of those things, and, and we're gonna introduce one of them today. Um, and so, you know, I think, uh, you know, hopefully this brings out some questions, and, and as you start going through this for the rest, remainder of 2021, you'll, you'll bring up some more interesting uh, devices and, uh, and approaches that, that are innovating in, in the Venus space. Absolutely, that, that's the idea of this, and eventually, if, if uh, God willing, we might have a meeting, you know, every other year about vein and lymphatic uh, uh, topics. Well, today we are going to divide this, the program in two sections. The first one is, as you saw in the title, the inferior vena cava uh, filters, the, uh, the current state <coughs> in this device. Seems like nowadays things are changing on a daily basis. New, truth, new truths are coming uh, every hour. So it's difficult sometimes to keep up with the advances that our that the technology is offering in our field. So uh, Dr. Bismuth is, uh, um, has done multiple cases in regards to vena cava, not only implanting, retrieving difficult cases, and it's something we are going to discuss today. So to start, um, I'd like to offer a brief introduction because I know some of our audience are, you know, from medical students to full uh, practicing vascular surgeons around the world. So I like to, for the medical students and people that are not familiar with inferior vena cava mm. filters, I like to do a, you know, brief introduction. So history to me is very important because if you do not history, if you do not know history, you are uh, condemned to repeat the same mistakes again. And uh, it's always it's always encouraging to see all the stuff that was done before 
uh, we got to the current status of this device. So it's going to be brief. In 1934, Homans was the first one to uh, propose ligation of the vena cava when patients have deep venous thrombosis in the proximal system, that is from the popliteal veins up, because the higher risk of uh, pulmonary embolism and death. In 58, the WIST designed basically the first filter. It wasn't quite a filter. It's a little, it's, it's heat thread uh, silk sutures in between the, uh, the vena cava in uh, about two millimeters uh, space and very carefully not to uh, obstruct or collapse the vena cava with the sutures. This screen acted like a filter, of course, require an open approach and uh, I mean, a, a extensive dissection of the vena cava in order to do it properly. And that obviously has comorbidities. Uh, Spencer then took this a little bit further and tried some um, uh, mattress sutures in order to uh, divide the vena cava like in three different tubes that will decrease the lumen of the cava, facilitating the blood flow and hopefully trapping the, the clots that were destined for the lungs. But really it wasn't until 1963 that Mobin Udin filter became available, giving, giving uh, you know, uh, birth to this wonderful uh, endovascular technology field that we all of us, we live nowadays. And this filter was the basic, gave the basis, the DNA basis, if you will, to the upcoming devices. Uh, the Adams DeWeese designed a clip that uh, was also easier to put that put in the, the, the previous men previously mentioned grid harp that the DeWeese uh, did in, in 58. But this clip, again, required a lot of dissection. And with the, uh, in, with the introduction of the uh, IBC filter by Mobin UD in, in, in 63, then the things didn't go that way anymore. And finally, in 1981, as we know, Dr. Phil Greenfield uh, this, uh, introduced his, uh, his filter, this uh, device that was uh, inserted percutaneously and seemed to be the answer for uh, to prevent uh, venous thromboembolism. And locally, in 1984, one of our own, Dr. Jack Rom, here in uh, Houston, in Methodist Hospital, with Jan Turco from uh, um, uh, Bentop Hospital, designed the uh, birth nest. So this is this is the the, the general idea of the venous uh, the, of the history in the inferior vena cava filter. Now, again, for all of you that are not familiar, the, the inferior vena cava filter is an umbrella-like structure, obviously without the fabric, that place that is placed in uh, through the groin and is placed in the inferior vena cava, which is the main vein that returns blood to the heart from the pelvis and lower extremities. And I want to make sure that people understand this because when I, when I have patients that have filters, they, they point to the groin thinking the filter is in the groin. No, the filter is in the abdomen. The groin was the site of uh, access in order to deliver the filter. The vena cava, again, is the main vein that is located in the abdomen, roughly in this area. And the way to do this is we introduce a wire through the right groin preferently in order to access the, the vena cava and then we deliver the catheter. This catheter already has the filter inside. We remove the wire and then gently remove the sheath leaving the filter in place. Now all this needs to be done uh, below the renal veins for multiple technical reasons. Uh, so with this advances in filter uh, development then it became a, a myriad of filters. A, you know, a lot of devices, different uh, uh, companies that basically inundate the, the, the whole market for vena cava filters. And as you can see, the DNA, so-called DNA of the filters is pretty similar. They have almost the same shape. So they share a lot with each other. Uh, one example is the ones on uh, the uh, top left corner. Those are the same filter with slight variations. One is the Denali filter and the other one is the recovery filter, both from BART. So you can see there is a lot of similarities in these devices. So in preparation for what Dr. Bismuth is going to present for us here, I'd like to go over the indications of 
uh, uh, impurity in a cable filter, which is, has been very controversial in many ways, especially after the um, damage of the filters was identified and the retrievable filters became available, everything swift and changed rapidly. So the, the only um, indication, classic bulletproof indications for implanting a filter is when the patient has a venothromboembolism thromb and there is an absolute contraindication for anticoagulation. That's it. From there, we have expanded indications. When the patient is in anticoagulation and the patient has the recurrent venous thromboembolism, has a progression or worsening of the already present DVT, or the patient has a massive or high risk for pulmonary embolism uh, with concurrent DVT, uh, risk for death secondary to embolization, uh, iliocabal or free floating proximal DVT, um, patient already uh, with anticoagulation with thrombolysis of iliocabal a cable DVT, massive PE, uh, difficult anticoagulation and high risk for complications if the patient is anticoagulated. Those are the main things that, uh, that you know, in, encompass the expanded uh, soft indications, if you will. And this is where the controversy comes. So the, there is a special sector, a special part of the patients that deserve uh, uh, mention is cancer-associated thromboembolism, pregnancy, as well as prophylactic in trauma or bariatric surgery. All these are very uh, uh, difficult to uh, encase and put in some strict, rigid indication and deserve in uh, discussion with whatever the patient is and with, with uh, the, the, in the vascular service, radiology, whatever, because it's not easy to make a decision in these patients when to place a filter. To, show how controversial can be the, the indications for uh, an IBC filter. This table is in an, in an article published in 2020 in a, a combined, effort from, combined effort from Chicago and, and Philadelphia. And um, you can see how the society is not even, in, not only in the United States, also in Europe, they have some um, disagreements in which, when and how to place uh, the filters. So this introduction I, uh, I put in here for, uh, as a preface from what Dr. Bismuth is gonna present. He has very interesting cases. And again, I remind you, uh, in your screen, you'll have in a minute the, uh, the way to contact us to ask questions during this uh, presentation. Um, and John. Thank you, Ulysses. So, I mean, that's a perfect introduction to what we're gonna talk about. Um, so obviously technology has changed over the years and you know one thing that I think has remained fairly consistent is the general overuse of filters in in the US and so you know maybe um, I, I can lend a little bit of uh, interest into that area and that maybe we can influence how people think about filters and the need for filter placement uh, certainly, we talked about it early on. Um, there is obviously a revolution in, uh, in venous disease, but there's also a revolution in uh, thrombectomy devices. Um, we've right. seen a bunch of new things come on the market, and, and I think it changes the way we approach uh, some of, of uh, these uh, problems that we encounter. I hope that you guys uh, interact with these cases. I have two cases I'm gonna show. And I'd, it'd, it'd be nice if you ask some questions. Hopefully you get something out of these cases. Um, certainly that is why we put this together. Um, just an overview of what we're gonna do is so I'm gonna present my cases. Um, there's a little bit of room for discussion between each case. Um, and then I'm going to talk about um, uh, how to retrieve uh, a, um, a filter of the kind. Both, both cases I'm presenting today have the same filter uh, and how we remove that because uh, there are some nuances to that. Uh, so we actually used to, um, and we'll probably do again this year if, uh, if COVID conditions change, uh, we will hopefully uh, start uh, performing a, a filter retrieval course again here in Houston at our, um, our education facility, MITEI. 
uh, and I actually used to teach this course with uh, Kumar Madassari, who is um, uh, chief of service at uh, Rush University in Chicago, a uh, good friend, and certainly has a lot of insight into this kind of work. The first patient is a, uh, but first of all, both of these patients were from this year, um, and, uh, uh, and you'll see there's, uh, they're both treated kind of the same way, uh, but there are definitely some nuances between each case. The first patient is a 59-year-old uh, obese male, uh, previous uh, uh, school teacher, and his past medical history was significant for a left lower extremity DVT in 2003. Uh, at that time, his uh, workup for hypercoagulable condition was negative. Um, he had a PE again uh, in 2005 and had a trapeze filter placed. Uh, otherwise, he's diabetic, hypertensive, um, hypercholesterolemia, and he has sleep apnea. Um, when he presented this time, he essentially presented uh, in May uh, of this year uh, with generalized weakness, uh, progressive swelling of bilateral lower extremities. Uh, he was on warfarin, uh, 10 milligrams with an INR uh, in, in the appropriate range of 2.3, uh, but stopped to have uh, a high-intensity focused ultrasound uh, for prostate cancer on 5-13-2020. And then on 5-15, he ultimately uh, noticed some hematuria and bilateral low extremity swelling, as well as some shortness of breath. Um, he was off anticoagulation for the procedure um, uh, approximately a week before um, he, he developed uh, the swelling. Uh, his CTP protocol was negative for PE. Um, ultrasound did demonstrate uh, extensive bilateral DVTs, and he was COVID negative. Of course, that's important in this consideration because we know uh, during the COVID period, a lot of patients were developing thromboses. So this is the first um, venogram, obviously, from the uh, right, uh, sorry, left groin. And you can see the thrombus uh, already in the external iliac, and you can't even see uh, the cava really reconstitute up higher, although you can hopefully appreciate the trapeze filter sitting there in the vena cava. Um, we started by uh, just placing lysis catheters. Um, and the next day brought him back. And this is what we found when we brought him back. Obviously, uh, there is uh, better flow than there was the first day, but clearly not flow through the filter. So we, um, uh, actually, I can't even take credit for it. I have to give uh, my resident, uh, Philip Aoyoung, credit for this because I actually left the room to do another case and, uh, and put him in charge of um, trying the Penumbra Indigo System CAT-8. Um, this was my first attempt at this. Um, and much to my surprise, when I came back, uh, you can see here on the first image, there is um, thrombus at the top end of the filter, which is adherent uh, to, to the top end above the filter, actually. Um, and then on the second image, you can see that that's gone, uh, all that removed with the CAT-8. Um, if we then continue further down, uh, ultimately, on the second image, you can see that essentially the entire filter is cleaned out and there's no longer any thrombus within this IVC filter. Um, you can see here kind of what we were able to remove. On the, um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see a thrombus sitting in the, floating around in the left uh, iliac vein. And then again, uh, with uh, more effort with a CAT-8, and in this case, we use the separator, which basically breaks up the clot and allows you to suck that back into the catheter. Um, we're able to remove all this. Uh, one thing you should know is there is um, a 12 French system available at this point, which is really made for large uh, thrombus removal. Um, in neither of these cases did we use that. For this case, it actually wasn't available yet. Um, the other thing that wasn't available for this case yet either was the, um, the lightning system, which allows you to uh, reduce the amount of blood loss that you potentially have um, using the indigo system. This is essentially what it, what, what it represents. So this is the CAT-8 system, 8 French system, and then the separator, um, which you see just below. At follow-up, um, we had continued anticoagulation with Eliquis. The patient was following up with the hematologist, and the uh, workup for a, a hypercoagulable uh, uh, issue was negative. Um, the follow-up ultrasound uh, was comparable uh, on both sides with normal waveforms. Uh, and, and no indication of any residual uh, clot. Uh, there were no reflux, uh, there was no reflux in his veins, remarkably. 
And um, we then re retrieve the filter, and you see that in those images just below. We retrieve the filter in October of this past year uh, successfully. Um, if there are any questions at this point, I, I will take those before we move on to the next case. And if there aren't, I'll just go right into it. Well, I, 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 I have a question, uh, Jean. You know, this patient mm -hmm. obviously is high risk, is obese, mm -hmm. diabetic. Yep. Uh, and has history of prostate cancer, right? Correct. So when the filter, it does exactly the type of patient I was mentioning in the last part of my brief presentation about the special p part of the people, you know, BTE on cancer patients, pregnancy <coughs> and trauma, all that kind of stuff. So when you put a filter on these patients, do you have any particular choice with the anticoagulation, specifically DOACs or, or uh, uh, vitamin K inhibitors? Or? Well, so, so as per the hematologist, if you have a, if in your, if your, your coagulation profile, you have an anticardiolipin, um, then you're better off on Coumadin. Um, because then your DOACs will fail. Correct. Otherwise, today, we put them all on DOACs. Yeah. Um, and, and my preference is Eliquis, but I mean, Xarelto is, is just, as, just as well. I just, that's been my preference. Yeah, that, that's important because this revolution in anticoagulation that has happened uh, sometimes catches people off guard and Correct. they don't know what to put them on. And, and, <laughs> and uh, it, all those details are important in order to try to keep the filters patent. Yeah, I think one of the things that comes into play with our patients, and I'm sure you've seen it, is the cost of the DOACs, right? Yes. Um, so there obviously there are some programs where you can uh, get the DOACs at a, at a reduced cost or sometimes even have you know, a period of time where you can get them for free. Um, but it is expensive, it is. ultimately. And so some patients um, go on sort of the traditional warfarin. Um, we've even actually had some younger patients go on Lovenox long term. Long uh, term. Long term. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's well, the three months, right? If they don't have any, any uh, uh, issues with coagulation, then three months um, and, then, yeah. and then get off them. But uh, yeah, no, ultimately, I think cost has to be part of the, uh, of the discussion. Correct. Now, and in regards, this is just information, general information. When we put in stent in the venous system, you know, for May Turners or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, we usually double anticoagulate right. for a brief period of time. We right. do the anticoagulation with, with antiplatelet therapy. This is not the same thing, but any experience with adding antiplatelet to these patients to decrease the rate of obstruction or occlusion? Uh, of a filter? Yeah. No, so I'm not really yeah. with a filter. I would say I, I probably, um, if, if I read what you're saying, I, w I would say I do the same thing when there are stents I add yeah. um, for a period of time. So also it depends on whether, it's, uh, whether you're doing it for occlusive disease or whether you're doing it for non-occlusive disease, Correct. right? Correct. Uh, the results are obviously a lot better stenting for non-occlusive disease than they are for occlusive disease. Absolutely. Uh, but I universally add an antiplatelet um, usually with a DOAC mm -hmm. uh, for at least three months, and then they stay on antiplatelet. Now, of course, there's no science behind that, though, right? I mean, we do that really based on, on intuition more than anything else. Yeah, uh, I agree. And uh, some of these questions um, we are trying to ask on purpose, so uh, med students that are out there uh, watching also, you know, can hopefully uh, learn something, and, and, and we can show them. Uh, teach you something and get some benefit out of these uh, shows. Okay. Okay. We'll go on to the next one. Next one is very similar, although there's, there's some nuances and, and the management's a little bit different. Now, basically, this is a 55 year old male, really just a past medical history of, um, of HIV and hypercholesterolemia. Um, now, he had a DVT in 2006 in connection with uh, surgery for a benign brain tumor. Uh, interestingly enough, the filter wasn't placed until uh, a year later, and, and there was no clear reason for, for its placement. Uh, but he was never offered uh, anticoagulation, and appropriately enough, he had a trapeze placed as well, um, was never offered a, a filter retrieval because it's, in principle, not a retrievable filter. Um, the, the correlate for um, the trapeze, which is supposed to be retrievable, is the optes, and we'll go through that a little bit later. Uh, essentially, um, in uh, September of this past year, uh, he was seen for back pain uh, in the emergency room, given some naproxen, a steroid injection, um, and kind of sent on his way. Um, he had some left uh, uh, leg swelling and some uh, right hip pain, 
Um, and uh, he, they did a CT just like they always do in, in an emergency room. That's kind of the standard. He had some inflammation in his uh, retroperitoneum, and it was thought that maybe it was colitis, uh, and that's essentially how the radiology report uh, read. Um, and so he was given also uh, Cipro and Flagyl. Um, and then uh, ultimately he had some symptoms about a week to 10 days before his initial ER visit. Uh, he was COVID negative as well. And his CT scan, uh, it, you know, when I look at it, there was uh, a, a bunch of edema around the vena cava, uh, particularly posterior to the vena cava. And then the left common iliac vein was severely inflamed, almost like a thrombophobitis uh, with a, a lot of fluid around it. A little bit of an unusual finding, I think. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I'd like your thoughts on that a little bit later. And you'll see some of the imaging uh, because I think it shows that really, really well. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't bring the IVIS images, which I think would have lent a little bit more as far as understanding what the, the vein looked like. Um, but we'll, we'll, I think we'll get enough out of this. So these were the initial images on, on day one. And you can see, essentially, the legs are emptying through the ascending lumbar veins. Uh, and you don't see the uh, vena cava pacify in any way at all. Um, and we, we started, uh, we had some experience now with uh, the penumbra system and decided that we would try and thrombectomize uh, with that. And this is what this looks like after um, uh, multiple passes. Uh, obviously, not great. But let me ask you, Ulysses, what do you think about the haziness around that common iliac vein on the left side? You know, I mean, it is, it is, well, it is significant, obviously. I wonder, you're right, I wonder what the IVAs show there in that. Yeah. Because, you know, doesn't look quite right, but uh, I don't know if it's a chronic, acute, or is it even external, you know? There is, there is some, there is some um, heavy suggestion that it's intravascular, but I don't know, I'm not convinced. The IVAs will be awesome there. Yeah. To, to well, well, so the interesting thing was, and, and it shows even better on the second day when we IVIST uh, the patient, is that we, you couldn't really appreciate any, any intraluminal thrombus after a thrombectomy. Okay. Um, but what you could see is the wall was significantly thick. Thick. Right? Um, and, I, and I wonder how you, know, how you would have dealt with it, and certainly I, I, I would hope that the, the viewers could also give us a little bit of insight on, on how maybe they would have handled this Maybe I didn't handle right. We'll see how I handled it. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it's, it's good. Um, go ahead. So here, again, we placed uh, lysis catheters after thrombectomy, um, and uh, we came back on, on day two, and this is what this looked like. Mm. Uh, a little bit better, obviously. You're not mm. seeing, seeing the ascending lumbar veins the same way. You are seeing some contrast go up through the IVC, but it's obviously not perfect. Right. Um, so we, we continued and we did some more thrombectomy with the, uh, the, with the penumbra. And, and the key thing here was really clearing out that filter. Uh, and one thing we could see was that ultimately we were pulling out a lot of chronic material out of that filter. Not surprisingly, right? It's been in there since 2007. Correct. Um, and so that's exactly what you'd expect, particularly with a filter like the trapeze. Uh, ultimately, um, uh, at post-op day one, after, um, let me go back actually on, the, on this last one. So if you appreciate it here, we ended up stenting the left side. I just yeah. wasn't happy with the way that looked. Would you have done that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was, I was looking at that left common iliac, external iliac, normal iliac, and looks 100% better than the previous image. And that couldn't be obviously for thrombolysis. Mm -hmm. And then I appreciate that the stent <laughs> clearly there. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I did the right thing. So I, no. I actually, the front end, um, I, I stented with a, um, with a Vibon, 13 millimeter Vibon, and then okay. I extended it with a uh, wall stent. Yeah. Um, so I don't know whether that's the right way to approach it. Certainly there are a lot of newer devices on the market now, uh, specific uh, stents uh, for the venous uh, space. Yeah. But, but I think, you know, this was a little bit of an unusual circumstance. I wasn't really happy with what I was seeing on the IVIS, so that's, that's essentially how I managed but that. Let, let me ask you, you, yeah. you, said, you said you hope you managed that right because the type of stent or because placing the stent? The type of stent. Okay. Yeah, yeah. the type of stent. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I think it's always difficult to, it's, I mean, I'm sorry, it's easier to judge with 2020 yeah. retrovision. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, you should have put this. But when you are there in the thick of the situation, right. yeah, you right. do the best yeah, you can. Yeah, for me, it was really what I was seeing on the IVIS really dictated exactly. me doing that. Exactly. Because if that, if that um, 
uh, what was obstructing the common iliac vein and external iliac is a combination between fresh and old thrombus. Right. If you put some uh, non-covered stent, there is a good chance it's going to be embolizing and maybe even worsening the uh, the proximal. Uh, yeah, I, I had no idea how that was going to behave. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, at least from a symptomatic standpoint, um, the post-op day one, his back pain completely resolved, which was interesting because even after the first day when he was in the ICU on lysis, he still had, his back pain was unchanged. So not that I wow. have the answer for why that was the case. Um, we followed him up with ultrasound about a month later, and he had a little bit like the other guy, uh, no evidence of any uh, residual DVT. Uh, he had normal and equal waveforms, uh, bilateral femoral veins, and then uh, obviously his stents on the left side were patent. Um, he, uh, he continues on Eliquis, and uh, his hypercoagulable pa panel was also negative. Negative. Yep. Um, and what you can see there, what I'm showing there, obviously, is we retrieved his filter in, uh, in December of this past year. A um, little more challenging than the previous one, uh, but it, nevertheless, uh, we got that filter out. So any questions at this point? Uh, the thought in the next steps of this, of this presentation is to go through kind of the steps uh, that we take uh, to remove this filter. I'm sure there are multiple ways to do this, uh, and it's kind of why I spoke about the course we do, um, because in bringing in Kumar Madassari, I think the advantage of doing that is you bring in somebody with some different uh, points of view and some perspectives that maybe uh, aren't what I do. And, and so um, I'm going to kind of show you what, how I approach these problems and, uh, and, and hopefully you know, lend a little bit of insight again into, into how to do this. Yeah, does that work? Yeah, that, that, that's perfect. I mean, this is a typical case that we learn, uh, you know, what, how to do it on the run right there. Yeah. When, they, when the thrombus is not, is not getting better with thrombolysis, open up some, some of the uh, main channels intravascularly, but still there is some residual that is significantly obstructing the vein. You got to do something. Correct. Now, what kind of stent? Again, or once again, it's very easy to go back and criticize backwards, right? When you are right there, you try to do the best you can. So I, I can't even say that anything. I think that was nicely managed, I mean, from my, from my point of view. Thank you. So I wanted to just real quick talk a little bit about filter thrombosis and really what the uh, risk factors are. The main risk factor, actually, uh, if you review the literature, uh, is, uh, is probably design of the filter. And the double basket filter, which really is what the trapeze is, uh, are probably the, the, the filters that carry the highest risk. Um, then, of course, the longer the filter has been in place, uh, the higher the chances for thrombosis to develop. Um, hypercoagulability obviously goes without saying, is a risk factor. And then finally, cancer. And I think, Ulysses, you said that well at the beginning, is these are the same risk factors that keep showing up again and again and again, Correct. right? Correct. L let me ask you something. The, the, the hypercoagulability, the mm -hmm. hypercoagulable state, you know, we always try, you, you did the workup in both patients mm -hmm. and they're negative. Right. And the truth of the matter is how many, when, how often is positive? I yeah. mean, I, you know, I, I'm I, not going to. I couldn't tell you that, but I, I, I know what you're saying because sometimes you're frustrated. You, yeah, you, you and know. it's negative, keep Correct. seeing negative. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and we are, you know, you know, not talking about the obvious thing, like right. you mentioned that the design of the filter, because it's a foreign body there, no matter Correct. what. Correct. And, Correct. Uh, and it's going to have repercussions. You know, interestingly, when, even when you remove sort of the, 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 the filters like the select or the tulip, um, even the BARD filter, a lot of times I've had patients say, well, you know, one leg is a little swollen and so on. And then you remove the filter and lo and behold, it goes away. Yeah. There's no way you don't alter flow by yeah. having a filter in place. Absolutely. Right? Probably not like the, the historic ones that you showed, uh, yeah, but nonetheless, you're still, you're still uh, you know, altering flow in some way. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of the, one of the causes of post-flebitic syndrome is an IBC filter, even if there is no thrombus. Right. How? There is, you know. There is, yeah. So in this particular patient, the, the back pain is kind of a puzzling, right? Yeah, that one. Uh, when you start describing the CT, how the iliac system and the vena cava look with peripheral fluid, looks sounds like an inflammatory, uh, you know, those all inflammatory thrombophobitis. Yeah. we see it. We yeah. see it in, 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 you know, in superficial veins. Correct. And sometimes we have to excise the vein. Correct. Because uh, now this, this patient, I know, was work up, but any blood cultures. Uh, yeah, blood cultures were negative. Negative. Actually. Yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. add that in. Blood cultures were negative, 
And he was on antibiotics for a period of time yeah. because they had thought he was, he had colitis. Correct. Um, Correct. But, you know, yeah, clearly that wasn't what, the, what it was. And after the filter was removed and the system was reopened, you have, we, we have not repeat the CT or I to see what happened no, to I have not fluid. repeated the CT. I really just based off his symptoms yeah. resolving, I figured, no, probably yeah, some, no, of that, no. some of that irritation is going to be going away. It's one of those things that there is nothing written about Correct. that you got to navigate it. I certainly have never seen it to that yeah. extent. Yeah. Um, so I'll go on to uh, the, the last part of this presentation. Um, and of course, it is a patient, uh, but really it's about the technique. Um, and so I'll just brush over this pretty quickly, but obviously there's a motivation. This is a 20 year old woman. There's a motivation in a young girl to actually remove a trapeze filter, which is a permanent filter. And why would you put that in, in, a, in a young girl really with some bleeding after a kidney biopsy? You know, I think there's probably other ways to manage that and not have her have a, a permanent filter, which really would put her at risk for the rest of her life to have an IVC occlusion. Uh, as you can see it right there in the middle, that's the trapeze filter and what it looks like. I showed you a picture of that a little while ago, um, pretty clear. Um, this, is, this is a video it's, uh, we'll go through, kind of the steps of how we approach this. Um, one of the nuances with this uh, placement, uh, unfortunately, it was placed a little bit low. So it's actually at the confluence of the left and, and right iliac veins, and which proved to be a little bit of, a, of an issue as far as us retrieving it. But ultimately, in retrieving these, um, you need uh, access from our standpoint, you need access from above and below. And essentially what we try and do is by traction on both sides, you try and collapse that filter so that you can then re-engage it into a sheath. Um, this was actually uh, you know, shown to us by, by somebody some years ago. Uh, my colleague Carlos Bishara and myself did um, the first one together and we've, we've since then done uh, quite a few of them. And, and for the most part, I don't know that we've actually failed on any in, in, in the recent past. Uh, but ultimately, here you go, we get big sheaths in. And when I say big sheaths, you're generally in the range of 20 uh, mm. to 14, not, not smaller than that. Uh, so coming from the neck, generally what we recommend is uh, something that's at least 30 centimeters long. You can judge your patient. If it's a tall patient, you may need to go to a 45 centimeter sheath. But generally, it's a 30 centimeter sheath. Um, and you need access on the right side uh, uh, for both uh, the neck and the groin. In this case, you'll see we actually have access on the um, left groin as well. And the reason for that was really because um, you, we essentially had, had a hard time uh, as the filter was at the uh, confluence uh, from below. Uh, when I take uh, catheters to, to try and get whether it's this or another filter, when I try and get the hook, if I can't um, snare it uh, by standard fashion because it's been in for a long time, um, I loop snare it for the most part, uh, and that's what we're doing from above and below. And you really try to loop snare it really at the cone. Um, and so most of the time I'll use a catheter called a, a VS1. It's like a shepherd's hook, a sauce catheter or something like that. Uh, it allows me to put it inside the filter pull it down and I can, I can see whether I have either a secondary barb or I have the actual body, the, uh, sort of the cone of the filter. Um, here in this case, we think from the bottom here that we actually have it, we really don't. Um, and so the, the, the next process of this is um, a sort of complicated way of coming uh, up and over uh, to the left side and actually snaring the wire from the left over to the right and back through. Um, we'll show you this in just a little bit. Um, what you can see at the top is uh, you see two markers for sheaths. And oftentimes, particularly for these filters, uh, because you really want a lot of support, uh, if you don't have enough support, what happens is your sheaths will collapse. Um, so the most common sheaths we use for this, um, and I actually don't even know the name of them, they're purple cook sheaths. Uh, and they are very rigid. Um, I know that the uh, laser um, uh, device actually comes also with a, a metal sheath. Uh, the other way you could do it uh, probably is to use a forceps, so GI forceps to go down and grab uh, the hook. Mm -hmm. um, I, that is not what I generally do, so, but there are, again, multiple ways of doing this. Um, <clears throat> some other approaches to potentially getting the filter off the wall, uh, remember, 
not only does, do these filters have two uh, sides to it, uh, so they're sort of double cones, they also have a lot of wall apposition. And so in order to get them off the wall, you can also use laser, just like you would take your leads uh, uh, off, the, off the wall, if you're, 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 you know, your, your, yeah. your, your pace air leads. Um, so you could, you could do that as well. Um, here where you can see on the bottom is we have a, a second sheath uh, through our big sheath. We're trying to go up and over so we can actually get that wire. Um, we're in the right position as far as our wire going over to the uh, left side, but we need to snare that so we can pull it through. And that's really where we're going next. I can actually speed this up a little bit so we, we can no, see. it's okay. I mean, it's, a, um, it's well, an excellent learning experience for our viewers as well because this is very specific, very clean, and, you know, you are explaining in detail. So, so here we go now. We can see we're, we're essentially trying to get our sheath up and over. Now, in this case, we're using a clover snare. Uh, the clover snare has um, a little bit of a, about a centimeter and a half piece, which is fairly rigid, just at the base of the actual snare. That means sometimes to get it through a, a flexible sheath up and over a uh, bifurcation, in this case, the venous confluence, can be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, you can put a little bit of bend of that on that if you, if you need to. Um, but ultimately, most of the time, we can get it up and over. Uh, and ultimately, that's what we end up doing here. Um, I will advance it just a little bit so we can see that real quick. And here we go. So here you go now. So uh, our, our basically, our, our snare is coming up and over. Here's the sheath coming first, then the snare. And uh, we're all ultimately going to deploy that and pull our wire through from uh, left to right. Here you can see that's that little rigid portion that I was talking about in the, in the, uh, the snare. So one of the things um, that also I think, uh, particularly when we do this with residents, some of the things they, they, they respond to is the amount of traction you need to put on the back end of the wire when you finally exteriorize it is pretty significant. Uh, and I would say it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, so yeah, no, 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 <laughs> I'm just looking here and, okay. So anyway, so you can see here now uh, our snare is up and over. Um, we're about to, to push that out. There you go. Here comes the snare, and then we're going to, there it comes. Mm -hmm. So you can see that now it's deployed. Um, and so we'll pull that wire back. You snare, we snare it right there. You see, and now we're pulling it back, okay? So now you're going to have uh, traction on that bottom end, and you can see it's exactly where we want it. We want it at the tip of that cone. And so we're super happy with where that is. And so the next process is to ultimately get it uh, from the top end the same way. Um, you can use a variety of catheters. Uh, sometimes you can, there will be sort of webs at the top end of these cones, and it can be hard to get it right under that cone. And so there are, you know, you, you, I think you basically see how the catheter and the wire are behaving, and you find a way to do that. Ultimately, you need to verify that you're in the right position so that when you pull, you aren't pulling on one leg and then rip that off uh, the filter. You can imagine that's probably not the right way to go. So here you can see bottom, on the bottom line. Now here we're doing it from the top end. Um, again, here we're using actually a KMP, uh, and the wire now loops up. Uh, we're going to snare that again. And then there you go. Um, now we have access from both sides. And now really here what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, get the filter in its entirety within one of the sheaths. Uh, we have, I'll show you pictures of exactly what the setup looks like at the end. But ultimately, in this case, we have three different sheaths. Uh, and on top of that, the, the snare. So we're pulling from both ends. Um, and there's quite, like I said earlier, there's quite a bit of traction. Uh, and here you can see as the big sheath is uh, going uh, up, and we're pulling down, uh, down from, from below, ultimately eventually releasing the filter completely from the wall. And you know that once your sheath is in the other sheath, you're free. You're free. Right? And yeah. so at that point, we're free, we're happy, um, and the filter is completely done. Here we go. We, we do our completion. There's no uh, bleed from the vena cava. Uh, and the vena cava is fairly tolerant. Yes. Um, you can see the ibis here uh, along the side. Again, you can see the wire, but there's 
no longer any filter, there's no residual thrombus, um, and uh, the cava is intact. Wow, phenomenal case, man. You know, it, that, a couple of things, I mean, I'm sorry. Is, no, that's, is, yeah, that, so I'm just gonna show kind of the yeah, setup. I, yeah. I said support, so you can see here, uh, we have the snare on the back end, uh, we have a, a, a sheath, um, which is really the retrieval system uh, from, uh, from Cook, and then we have a, a dry seal at the front end, and then one of the purple sheaths, um, and again, uh, here a different look at, at the same uh, approach. Um, and that's really, you can see here, the uh, endothelialization of the filter, but the filter is intact, and that's what the wires look like from either end. Um, so that's ultimately what we retrieve. That, this is this is amazing. That that case is is the miracle of, of the human body to, you know, tolerate that kind of a, a dissection. Normally, we are so afraid of the vena cava, yeah. because we understand veins as a very flimsy yeah. uh, organs, um, <clears throat> and retrieving that and doing a, making a perforation or a tear in the vena cava is really scary, but. When you're doing it skillfully and with experience and ready for any issues, you know you can uh, be successful. This is a phenomenal case. Yeah. I, I have I have a question, and you know when we, when I used to do um, EVARs and all that kind of stuff, we used to suture the arteries, you know, because the access, because the mm -hmm. sheets. You mentioned that they are large bore mm -hmm. sheets. So any particular way you like to finish the vein? I mean, do you? Put stitches, do you? So, so uh, as you probably know, there is a venous closure device on the market. I have never used it. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I'd be curious to see if anybody else has used it. I have not used it. Pressure. Just pressure. Pressure is all we do, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I interestingly enough, you know, I, I showed you in those two cases on ultrasound, there was no no thrombus post. And, and you would think, I think that's probably where you're going with it, you yeah. would think that maybe yeah. with all that instrumentation, yes. you'd find something at the end, right? Exactly. Yeah. No, Nothing. it's it's amazing. No, not only that, you, you do the instrumentation and then you put pressure yeah. for 15, 20 yeah. minutes for that's a, that's a big... That's a big deal. Yeah. Perforation. You know, I think the guys probably have the most experience with it are the EP guys. I mean, yeah. They're putting big sheaths and veins all the time, and all for the, the most part, they do well. Yeah. You know? yeah. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is for, uh, from Mahmoud Osman, and he is asking, what is uh, your strategies? What are your strategies to prevent pulmonary embolism in this, in this such big left iliac thrombus? I guess your first case during the penumbra uh in day one so and also i'm sorry yeah. go ahead go ahead no so i think you know the, uh, if i understand the question correctly it's you know how do, how do you remove that safely without creating a pulmonary embolus um so you know i think it's about understanding the devices you work with right there's there's a learning curve in everything you use uh, but ultimately i think if you if you understand your device and you can, you can approach these things safely, I think your, your, your risk of, of PE is probably relatively low. Of course, my experience is uh, for, for these uh, filter cleanouts, as I call them, is, is limited. We're, we're talking, you know, uh, under 10 cases. Um, but I do think it changes our ability, our perspective on how to, to approach these cases. Um, I, you know, I think you can, you can probably uh, understand that a lot of the clot uh, is actually very adherent to the wall. It's not as mm -hmm. free-floating as we think it is. Correct. You know, sometimes it may be, but for the most part, I think if you work your way up, uh, you're actually taking that clot burden off the, the wall from the bottom up, so you really your burden's going to be low by the time you get up to the front end. I mean, is that how you would approach yeah. it? Yeah, 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 likewise, yeah. So um, there's another question I, I'm trying to understand because the question reads in what ways is amputation a last ditch effort for dvt i imagine uh, i mean I, I don't know I, I, I don't know if it's amputation of the filter or it's amputation of i hope it's not amputation of the limb because no, that <laughs> no that that is never an alternative in yeah. this kind of situation right you know if if you have an an infectious situation with Phlegmatia that has progressed to ischemia and necrosis, well, that's a difference, right. different thing. But for a DVT, no, no, no. We, yeah. we, there is no clear indication for that at all. <clears throat> Go ahead. So, I, you know, I would say that uh, on other filters, not this filter, I have taken some out piecemeal, and certainly you can do that with a combination of snaring and, and forceps. Um, and if that's what you mean by amputation, 
I think most filters, um, you know, I've taken out uh, old Greenfield filters uh, mm -hmm. percutaneously. The, you know, with, with, with patience and, and, and a solid and safe approach, um, I think you can take out most filters. I think if you start adding in other techniques, I was talking about laser earlier, um, there are a lot of options out there. Uh, one thing I, I would say is, you know, don't, don't be foolhard in, it, in, in, in approaching these things. I mean, yeah, it is, you, you, you can obviously injure the wall. Um, my experience has been that it, the, the, the injuries are relatively limited. Um, I can really remember one patient where I had a, a little bit of a, a nipple on the, off the cava, uh, where the, the, the hook of the filter was embedded and really had a little bit of back pain and that resolved, we never did anything Correct. for it. Um, we saw it on CT and never did anything for it. So. And also, I may, I may add what uh, Jean just mentioned, is also the, the, the patience, the skills, and the environment that you mm -hmm. have, because if you require X or Y sheath that is not available, then you are in trouble. So uh, you need to have the right environment as Correct. well. Correct. And, uh, uh, and not so ready for any problems. You know? Correct, so absolutely. So you, you have to be ready to convert if that's the case. I will say I, I had discussed a case uh, with uh, my old partner uh, Carlos Bashara. He was he's now in in Chicago, and uh, we had discussed a case where he'd removed a filter and actually had some extravasation, and he put an aortic balloon up and held it there for I can't remember how long he said, and then when he took it down and shot again, it was gone. Uh, you have to remember that veins are low flow systems. Of course, if you disrupt them then they're very unforgiving, right? And even repairing a, a torn vein is, for those who have operated on veins open, it is, is a challenge. It's not um, an easy task. No, it's not easy. Mm -mm. And, and, the, and the fallacy is that people think because they are vein is easy, it's not a problem, it's low risk. It's sometimes I found after doing arterial surgery for X amount of years and I started doing vein surgery, Veins are tr more tricky to control Correct. and Correct. not traumatize. You yeah. know, it's funny. We always talk about arterial as the sexy, and yeah. it's been yeah. the sexiest thing. Yeah. But honestly, I find venous disease um, and this kind of stuff is, is really challenging. Um, but, you know, you pick up the tools that are, that are around you, and, and ultimately, I think you can, you can manage many, many of these things. Hopefully, we'll do this course again um, here in the near future, and, and, and we can welcome you down to Houston to participate in it. Uh, Jean, we have this um, question in uh, talking about, you know, vein, uh, vessel wall trauma. What are your tips or tricks to avoid perforation in case three, the last one you show? Yeah, so r really being careful. Um, so we take, um, we take precautions as far as, you know, I said we, we have a lot of traction on, on, on the filter, but, you know, we do use judgment. It's not like we're, we're boorishly going in like a bunch of yahoos and, uh, you know, thinking we're cowboys like, you know, we're, yeah. I know we're in Houston, but yeah, it's, you know, nah. it's, it, it, is, <laughs> it, it is about being careful. And, and really, you know, when, when you gain some experience with these, you understand when things are getting a little hairy and then you can back off. Um, but, you know, ultimately there, there are some nuances to how you advance the sheaths um, in, in preventing uh, injury. You know, w let me add one thing. One of the things that I learned after this, all this time to do vascular surgery is one of the valuable things is knowing your limits. Correct. When you uh, push that boundary, uh, the trouble And I, and I was going to say, one of the most important yeah. things is knowing when to stop. Yeah, know your limits. Right. And, and the second is don't be ashamed to ask for yeah. A fresh pair of eyes to Correct. help you. Correct. You know, we have collaborated many times in, in our yeah. cases yeah. when, you know, it's frustrating yeah. and we help each other. So yeah. know your limits and don't be ashamed to ask for, for help or, or advice. So uh, another question, we have a few minutes left. So uh, it's for you, uh, Jean. Is you mentioned that the, uh, the advent of new purpose design Venus stents. We have started to use several, but wanted to know your thoughts on how to evaluate the design and delivery mechanisms. Um, so I do have a little bit of perspective on that, um, mostly because I've, I've done some research on it. So um, we developed a few years uh, back a, um, a porcine thrombosis model where we've actually uh, tested some of these stents. Uh, my thought has been a little bit different than I think um, most uh, people. So most people will think along the patterns of, um, of 
uh, the, the wall stand. So wall stand is probably where we've had the most experience over the years. The wall stand, as you know, is a very rigid device. And so really the way we look at it is you try to make a circle out of what is not a circle. A vein is not a circle. A, cir a vein is generally elliptical. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I'm more uh, supportive of stents um, that have some compliance to them. I think that's really where you want to go. Uh, I, ha I, don't know, I haven't shown that uh, long term, not in our model either, but I've shown that in the behavior and how we've uh, dissected our stents uh, post implant in, in our porcine model. Um, there are, like you said, there are really uh, four stents on the market now. Um, and, you know, I think uh, experience will really give us some, some information in post market studies, hopefully, and then um, people reporting on their own experiences. Um, but my, my preference is for more compliance stent. A um, couple more questions. Uh, in case of manual compression post venous sheath removal, what is the site of compression, proximal or distal? I think this is this is actually interesting, yeah. you know, <laughs> because sometimes you have mm. people just putting pressure right in the in the, the skin perforation, and the the vein perforation is not there. Right. Right. So, what is your take on that, John? Yeah. So, I mean, I I agree. So, so generally, so up in the, up in the neck. Uh, most of the time what we're doing is we hold some pressure, obviously, but really we're, we're putting the patient in uh, reverse Trendelenburg, right? So just, just raising the head of the patient, that decreases the venous pressure, and that's already going to you know, slow down the bleed there. Uh, so that's for the head. In the groin, I really I hold uh, both places, yeah, proximal and distal, because yeah. you're going to get bleeding both ways. Exactly. Right? It, it is. It is. Um, so the next question is, what is the maximum time in days until we remove the filter? Ideally, so most manufacturers uh, will tell you for a removal filter up to a year. Um, there may be some, some differences in some of the, uh, some of the uh, manufacturers, but a year is generally a fairly accepted time. Um, how long have I removed one? Uh, I think the oldest filter I removed was 20 years old. Wow. Um, and then I removed one that was actually a little bit older than that, but that was open, and that was a bird's nest filter. Oh, that, that was, probably was wild. <laughs> so uh, we are running out of time. I want to thank our distinguished, uh, well, one more. Thanks for this. Oh, well, thank you for the compliment. Thank you for the compliment. So uh, thank you for helping me, John. Um, I'm very grateful. And you are welcome to come here anytime. Thank you. It's fun. Yeah, it was you a lot know, of fun. We are hopefully helping people out there that don't have access to the resources yeah. and the other ones to you know cement their their knowledge so we didn't have time to go over the second part of the lecture but you know we have many Wednesdays to come so I want to thank you for your, <clears throat> your attention your interaction that is what feeds these kind of events and uh, God bless you and we'll see you next time thank you John. thank you thank you very much <laughs>